Hello, this is Gökhan Bolaca. Uh, today I will be talking from London. And thanks very much to all Kalanish team to give me this opportunity to speak at the Asian Steel Market Conference. Uh, this is very important uh, market for us because as a Galex, uh, we are heavily involved in Asian markets and uh, we do source from Asian countries and sell into Asian, Asian countries. So it is quite important for us uh, to watch all the developments. And today I will try to contribute as much as I can with the insights and uh, some new information. And mainly we will be talking about China and Turkey uh, and hope to see you all uh, in the near future in physical conferences back again. So in China, what is going on? Uh, China is making a huge, huge advancements in terms of policies. And in return, after these policies, we see really big, uh, also significant advancements in the numerical improvement as well, such as 18% leap in this first quarter GDP already announced by China. And country uh, is like the world's largest foreign direct in, uh, investment destination. They already outpaced United States, which was the leader in terms of foreign direct investments. But now it is China. And comparison between Q year 2020 to 21 is 48% higher, which is, which is quite important for uh, country all these foreign direct investments. Nation made a big process uh, in such a, such a short time period, if you look at the last 100 years of China. But uh, now they are, into going, they are going into a different phase in their uh, development. And basically, as Xi Jinping already said, they are ready to cut the arm if it's for broader society's benefit. And now steel industry is one of the main targets uh, for the country. And since uh, all steel production is made by fossil energy and it is uh, creating a lot of problems, environmental problems, China is uh, quite focusing on these problems and steel sector industry will be one of the biggest one uh, that will go through uh, changes and sacrifices. And real estate sector will be another main target since uh, at the moment, the prices, real estate prices are very high. And we should remember, when we mentioned about real estate sector, we are talking about one third of steel, which is produced in China, goes towards construction. Uh, and real estate sector, any change in real estate, real estate sector will also uh, affect Chinese steel industry. And then uh, we should say that uh, it will go into complete change because it creates a lot of uh, inequality in terms of uh, wealth distribution. Very expensive real estate prices and like majority of the household savings goes for uh, down payment of these real estates. And uh, this is quite, quite uh, open to speculations. As uh, also President Xi Jinping says, uh, real estate is for to live in, not to spe speculate, speculate about it. They don't want any speculation in real estate the sector. They just want people to live in the apartments or houses. Uh, they don't see this as a tool, financial tool, to make money. So in Beijing agenda today, the widening of wealth gap requires more efficient wealth redistribution. Like Gini coefficient uh, test of China was 0 0.465 in 2019. This 0 0.4646 meaning like the more you are closer to number one, this means the country is more equal in terms of wealth redistribution. There is lots of work to do and they are taking uh, a lot of actions like different taxes for the wealthy. For example, more expensive real estate will get more taxes, etc. They are already started to work on this. National Fiscal Avenue. But we have to remember one thing when we talk about real estate. Why real estate so far was untouchable? Just because China's national fiscal revenue, 45% of it comes from real estate. How come? And how can they do this way? Uh, municipalities, they have all these lands. You name it like uh, Suzhou, you name it Shanghai. 
all these municipalities, they have this land registered to them and they are uh, giving this lands to builders and they sell this uh, lands to builders and builders pay the money. And this is the majority, like 70% of any municipality's fiscal revenue comes from this uh, real estate sales, like land sales, basically. They sell the lands to the builders. And this is very hard to change overnight. Uh, but this is also in agenda. Now they, they are taking actions. Carbon neutrality. Renewable energy is so much important. And China so far achieved in some production, in some industries, 80% production cut by using wind power and solar power. And after having this achievement, now new kid is on the block, which is hydrogen energy. And they are making huge steps towards it. This is like very disruptive. If they can achieve it anytime soon, it will be disruptive. Uh, it's something new and very efficient. So the country knows that they are not, they don't have enough oil. They have to import oil and they take a, any kind of action to avoid using uh, petrol kind of energy, fossil energies, in other words. And they made already big progress by using the solar and wind power. This is a huge number of 80% in some industries they achieved. So they shift their economy from less productive uh, and labor intensive to value added, high tech, such as take the example of Shenzhen, take the example of Hangzhou. These, uh, these are the new Silicon Valleys of China. And uh, there are lots of foreign direct investments in these two uh, cities. Of course, when we speak about wealth redistribution, we are talking about North and West China gets more and more investment, which is the poorer side of China, and it will get uh, more equal uh, distribution through this kind of uh, governmental, governmental projects and investment programs in these regions. And uh, digital RMB, we will be talking, which is very important on the next slide, more in detail. How to tackle and tackle with petrol and iron ore deficit. Speaking of petrol, uh, recently government made 400 billion equivalent USD, 400 billion USD equivalent agreement with Iran that consists of uh, energy uh, contracts, that consist of military uh, equipment contracts. Uh, it is quite important and China will be sourcing for this at least short term in the future, they will be sourcing their deficit uh, petrol from Iran. And they will pay in renminbi, not in United States dollars. And uh, very uh, last thing, one of the last thing I would like to say, steel prices today, uh, again, since 2015, Beijing involves uh, in the steel pricing in China heavily at different pace, at different time. But again, they become very aggressive. Because at the end of the day, the balance sheet of state-owned steel mills is the balance sheet of China. And today, just imagine, with Beijing's push, hot roll produce, producers, still state-owned hot roll producers are making $400 per metric ton approximately profit. And if you multiply by all the finished steel between $300 to $400 that China produces, then you will end up with how much profitable and how much contribution to this overall Chinese balance sheet through this kind of pricing uh, policy of China. Tax rebate, benefit and cost, yes, uh, there is a tax rebate will be diminished for sure. We don't know how many, which materials will be affected. There are so many rumors. But again, China is trying to become independent uh, of the energy that they import they want to be in the, become independent from the iron ore that they import and they want to even become independent from the exports because what they want to do, they want to prepare themselves for kind of big turmoil between West and China. And now all dependencies like the export, even like 8 million ton steel in their plan, they want to shift and they want this conflict even uh, exager exaggerated, uh, gets even aggravated between West and China, they can go on much easier than today. So they all this preparation, even the tax rate, plays some kind of role, uh, this strategy plays some kind of role in it. And they want to focus more and more domestically.
digital renminbi. Let's think about China, like 18% of the global output comes from the country. And you would expect something parallel, something match with it when you talk about same nation's currency. But when we talk about renminbi, it represents only a bit more than 2% of the global reserves. So this unbalanced situation is pretty much so much disturbing for Beijing and China to implement their future projects. First of all, there is a significant resistance from United States. Uh, they really want, uh, they take all the efforts uh, for this one belt, one road project not to go through. They use all, since United States dollars is the reserve uh, currency, they use all their tools to prevent this, like uh, sanctions, and they follow everything through the SWIFT. Since every single United States dollar world trade needs to go through American banks. So there is one way to do this, uh, and maybe the uh, most efficient way to do for Beijing, they've been working on this, is the digital renminbi. So they will uh, definitely uh, get much more potential to invest wherever they want without using United States dollars. And even more, uh, they will get the benefit of if they can do this as a like first government who implement uh, digital currency backed up by the government authorities, which will be the first. Hopefully, they will get uh, uh, more benefits at the end of the day. And Chinese authorities, we need to remember one thing here as well. United States financed by United States bonds, treasury bonds, etc. A lot of these uh, bonds uh, are offered to foreign participants and a huge financing relief comes to the government of the United States. China wants to do the same way and they want to do this through uh, digital renminbi. And uh, they are opening $15 trillion equivalent domestic bond market to foreign participants. Greater demand for these bonds definitely will push down yields and lowering borrowing costs. And we are talking about like really exciting projects of China and uh, I have to say they are doing one by one and taking a lot of already, they took a lot of effort and uh, they achieved a lot uh, of the uh, things that they wanted to achieve. There are so many, of course, a long way to go, especially this for one that one road project. It's not, uh, it is a huge project with more than 152 countries involved in it. And uh, if you remember, today world trade equal, equals to around $19 trillion. And one that one road project, once it's completed, it will, according to the calculations of projections of Chinese government, it will give around six, seven trillion dollars per year to China. Uh, that's why it will shift uh, all power uh, centers in the world. It's already actually shifting. As you see, foreign direct investments of China already exceeded United States foreign direct investments. It's, it is uh, significant. Uh, people couldn't uh, expect that. Like if you were talking 10 years ago, they could mean they might say it was it would be only a joke, but it's not anymore. So the same way, uh, China is coming quite strong. And what are the problems at the moment? As I, uh, I December, last December, I was mentioning these problems. They are still uh, on the table. It's not something to solve overnight. Non-performing loans of China, it is quite disturbing. And uh, as you see, there is a huge, from 2017 to 2020, there is a huge increase. And I ask uh, to my Chinese uh, office, uh, like, let's put this in a more, uh, like, something more easier to see, like, it's defaults, non-performing loss. Let's talk, let's get an example of mortgage default in China. In 2017, like, 9,000 households couldn't pay their mortgage back uh, to the financial institutes. In 2020, it was 2 million. So this also shows, uh, you can call this, uh, that distribution plays a role in this. Yes, it might. Uh, remember, uh, China, by the way, it's like one of the, in terms of household savings, household savings is like around 39% uh, in China, whereas in 
in the United States, and majority of the people uh, go for this high savings just because they want to buy a property. They want to buy a like kind of flats, house, to get some more sense of security. So this is China. Uh, then let's talk a little bit about Turkey. Since we are talking about Asian steel markets, and it is maybe for some people they already know, Turkey is coming quite aggressive in the export markets because they need to be, they have to, they have no other choice. Since uh, the majority of steel trade between Europe and Turkey is kind of uh, prevented by latest European uh, uh, safeguards against Turkish steel. Turkish steel is looking for another avenue to uh, give access uh, since Turkey became the net exporter in both uh, flat steel and long steel. For long, Turkey has been uh, exported for long years, but they also became for the flat steel. So more and more material will be in Asia. They already start to sell a lot of hot roll coil besides long steel to Asian markets. And we will talk about this. Let's give some snapshots Let's uh, about Turkish steel. So production altogether long and flat around 37 million ton in 2020. And like quite long production 23, flat production is 14 million ton. Consumption is 16 million ton. But there is also of course import. And at the end of the day, Turkey exported in 2026 million ton of flat steel and 10 million ton of long steel. The 6 million ton, uh, of course, it's peanuts compared to Chinese exports, but uh, this is a normal situation, isn't it? So if you compare anything to Chinese numbers, it will look very small. But 6 million at the end of the day uh, can really make impact on any kind of markets when we talk about uh, this is the quantity dedicated to export. In Turkey, uh, there are eight reviling mills besides uh, these integrated uh, mills. And uh, approximately 6 million tons capacity altogether for eight reviling mills. And 6.5 million tons of hot rock oil consumption comes from these eight reviling mills. So Turkey, not only a significant exporter, but also really important importer and 1.1 billion USD total exports comes from only this A3 rolling mills. Let's look uh, what Turkey uh, usually imports, which countries Turkey towards Turkey imports, ex exports and uh, where do they import from. Like Russia, uh, there is no doubt for hot roll and cold roll always takes uh, number one in terms of import, imports because of the also proximity between Russia and Turkey, material can reach quite, quite uh, quickly. And then European Union's countries, South Korea for cold roll, and these countries pretty much is the main countries to import from. And Turkey exports towards, as you see here below, all European Union countries as a like number one, number two, hot roll coil, cold roll coil. Uh, but this is changing significantly due to this restriction, due to these quotas uh, implied by, by European Union. And really steel needs to go to a different place. And more and more steel we will see in uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, as we already see a lot of uh, contracts concluded between Turkey and Vietnam for hot roll coil. And we expect China is becoming a net importer of steel and I think uh, another new avenue for Turkey will be China in very near future. I would be I would be saying like can even take less than a year. So thank you very much uh, to all my friends at Kalanish for the opportunity and I hope we can meet soon uh, in physical conferences uh, as we all used to it uh, and we like so much. Thank you very much.